Hello. Just wanted to say thanks for um, all the thumbs up and comments and new subs. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, it really helps with the uh, the algorithms. So, just wanted to say thank you. So, um, well, I I've went through a lot of like the uh, uh, not really too scary or too messed up type uh, things that occurred. Um, but, uh, well, eventually I got to get to the stuff that is, is seriously messed up. And, uh, I guess, you know, viewer discretion is advised. Um, cause it gets, uh, I'm going to tell some stuff that probably might, might spook some people or, you know, however, whatever the reason would be. Viewer discretion is advised. So, I think I've explained enough to, you know, I've explained some odd encounters. <clears throat> you know, the, the, the battle with the Western Alpha. Um, that one last time journey. Um, in, in those, you know, I've kind of described some, some of the other oddities that would occur, but... Um, some of the worst stuff still hadn't even been discussed. Oh. I don't even know where to start here. Um, so, one of the reasons I was able to describe sleep paralysis, I think it's in episode two, um, when I discuss how sleep paralysis when I got hit by that fear, it felt like sleep paralysis. Um, and the reason I know that is because I actually had several events that, you know, by definition it would be called sleep paralysis. But um, looking back, man, um, I think sleep paralysis is just the scientific way of explaining a phenomena. Um, and even if, you know, that's been proven in a lab, that's cool, but I don't think it fits for everything. <clears throat> because, um, when I remember waking up from what they call sleep paralysis, uh, I almost always had one or two black shadowed entities standing over me. And it would go, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night, you can open your eyes, um, but you can't you can't move a single thing and you can barely open your eyes and it feels like you have to struggle just to open your eyes and then you get your eyes open and, and you realize it's still dark in the room but you you see these entities uh, I would see them on the right side of me um, I don't because there was a wall to my left and the ceiling kind of curved away from the wall uh, where we live there um, so I would always see them on my right, uh, but there was always one or two, and they were dark. And <clears throat> so I would try and shout and squirm, and you know, like I'm, I'm thoroughly freaked out. You know, I wake up and there's these black beings in my room, and I can't move. I can't even, I can't scream. I can't do nothing. Like when you go to try and scream, it just comes out like, you know, you can't move your mouth. Um, and you have to struggle to even use your lungs to produce sound. So they got you, uh, <clears throat> you know, your pin there, you can't move, you can't shout, you can't do anything. And the reason I, I, I kind of refuse to accept the, uh, sleep paralysis thing is, um, out of the multiple times, um, I know this has happened to me. It's not like I would just struggle until I woke up. Um, it was a struggle back into the blackness, you know. And then um, you would wake up like, and the sun would be out. You know what I mean? 
It wasn't like you just woke up and it's still dark and everything's good and nobody's in the room or nothing like that. It was, you would you would fade back to black, and then it would be hours before you would wake up, wake up. You know, if it was, I would imagine if it was sleep paralysis, I would be able to half wake up and just struggle myself to fully awake. Um, but that's not how it goes. What they call sleep paralysis is just like a uh, more or less a side effect of whatever this is that goes on <clears throat> so I would have uh, I would say between the ages of uh, 13 and 18 um, at least three to five times a year um, those type events I have no like specificity as to you know what time of the year they occurred or like I have no kind of pattern to them I just know there was there was multiple times it would happen and they sucked <clears throat> well, other thing is uh <clears throat> now <clears throat> you gotta you gotta put yourself in my shoes here um, you know just poor country folk no internet nothing like that you know and we were surrounded by poor country folk and you know we weren't into like there was no like contra uh, what would they conspiracy theorist type stuff you know I mean that it wasn't really big <clears throat> and where we lived it was very like uh, Christian and you couldn't just go around if you talked about like um, something odd you seen, like you know, uh, we had seen um, the big black hairy thing. We had also seen <clears throat> me and one of my brothers. <clears throat> one day we were outside and Abel's Abel is out back and he's just barking, 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 and we're like, you know, what's going on? So we went out back and out behind our shed, what he was barking at was like. Um, now, some people going to be like, there's no way, but I'm just going to tell you what I saw. And, um, it is what it is. So out back behind our shed, man, there was a, there was a, a Jaguar or a Panther. I think it was a Jaguar in my opinion, because I noticed it had like this, this weird, almost octagon pattern in its in its fur like it had this this grid pattern not like a not like a cheetah well like a cheetah but it was more geometrical um, uh, I'm sorry I'm getting off on a little detail but so this cat was the way I've described it is as big as a cow um, it, it was as big as a full-grown cow, dude. This thing, it, we had a three-tier, three-wire barbed wire fence for the cows, and it ran all the way around, you know, the house and everything, and that, so we had the three-tier barbed wire fence, and if one of us would walk up to this barbed wire fence, that top wire on the barbed wire fence would be right around our chest height. And so if we're six foot, we're talking four, four and a half feet up, you know. <clears throat> so this cat was standing at that fence looking at Abel. And that cat's head was above that fence. And that cat saw us and turned and ran. And um, so, I mean, looking back, we were dumb, but we followed, dude. We, we chased that cat. Uh, out past we had about a five acre yard uh, and garden and we chased that cat out past uh, the uh, garden out to where the the field drops off you know because where we lived it was up on like a 10 acre plateau and it was downhill in all directions except the road uh, which ran the ridge we ran out to the edge of the plateau and we watched that cat run down that field across the bottom up the other ridge and all the way off to the left to the back corner into the woods so we got to watch that cat for like a a solid minute 
you know, and we observed it and, and how it moved. <clears throat> Once again, this was one of those uh, animals that moved like a shadow. Um, now, when we first saw it, you know, it seemed to move just like a huge cat, which was freaky, dude. You know, um, it turned and it took off, and we're like, holy cow, did you see that? You know, and we got all psyched up and smacked each other and just took off running after it, dude. Like, probably dumb as hell, but that's what we did, you know. And we ran up and we watched it, and it ran down, and we're watching it run by all these cows, and that's why we were like, you see how big that is? It's as big as those cows, dude. It's as big as those cows, dude. You know, and it's running through, and it runs up that other side. And what's messed up, why I'm saying all of this, is when we talked about seeing a, we described it as a giant black panther. And um, this is interesting because it was like everybody knew what we were talking about um one of our friends grandparents they knew what we were talking about like our friends knew what we were talking about one of our other friends parents knew what we were talking about it's like everybody has seen uh this this black panther throughout the county and um so it wasn't it wasn't uncommon i mean it was rare to see but people have seen it <clears throat> now this is why I'm saying all this is because the explanation for that Black Panther was this back in like the 1800s some like rare animal circus uh, broke down and they lost all these exotic <clears throat> and some of them were like going extinct type animals and they, they ran out into the woods and some of these animals have bred and interbred with other breeds of animals and have produced these things you know and i was like well that's crazy you know now this is the crazier part um in one of my episodes i talk about the devil wolf of pennsylvania and um my friend's parents talking about the devil wolf and like when they were kids but even more crazy was they uh they brought up the fact that back in the 1800s there was this exotic animal thing and it was the same thing i heard these like 90 year old tobacco farmers like 900 miles away say like the exact same almost verbatim story of this uh, circus with these endangered animals in the 1800s right I was like, man, that's crazy, you know, and I remember talking over with my wife about how that's like exactly what I heard in Kentucky. Well, we're in Arkansas, right? We went to Arkansas for about four or six months, and um, we had a couple encounters there, and uh, so I brought it up with uh, one of our neighbors, and uh this guy who he had lived in arkansas his entire life but he moves around like uh, he's a seasonal type worker but i was like dude i've seen this and i've seen this and he starts talking about what he's seen you know and then he's like you know it's not too crazy because back in the 1800s and he went into the same story that i had heard in pennsylvania and in kentucky and none of these people ever met each other and they're all telling me the same story uh, it was a little bizarre uh, from my point of view it, it, it's very bizarre it makes me think that <clears throat> maybe there was something to all this back in the 1800s uh, whether it was propaganda to cover up something or whether it was actual uh, legit something happened you know uh, but the odds of all these people spread out over thousands of miles all saying the same thing w over a hundred plus years ago um, that is definitely something in the culture it is something that's been passed on word of mouth you know um, and it's probably only going to be said by people who's lived there for uh, multiple generations not somebody who just moved there you know 10 years ago type but i just had to throw all that out man um <clears throat> but i mean talking about that type of stuff uh, you could talk about that type of stuff because it's more or less you saw you know 
something odd and you're explaining how you saw something odd and I mean usually everybody's got a I saw something odd type story so you could tell you could tell those type stories but you couldn't tell uh, these type stories which is um, so as a kid uh, once again those same that same age category like 13 to 18 I had uh, multiple experiences where um, <clears throat> I would just wake up out in the middle of nowhere um, it was always in an open field and um, you know the first the very first time it happened was the most freakiest of all times because um, here I am I think I was like 13 maybe 13 and a half you know and I, I wake up and it's like um, all I hear is coyotes howling you know I'm out in the middle of a field full moon and I come to and I'm standing there and all I have on is my boxers um, you know and I've got a first off realize that this is not a dream that this is real um, that I need to figure out what to do um, and thank goodness as a kid um, I walked around so much and I explored a lot because it really helped in these situations um, every time even including that first time I was very lucky in that I knew where I was within about 20 minutes of me waking up and, and coming to. Um, <clears throat> what I would normally do is, you know, climb up the, uh, the closest ridge and, and try and get my bearings, you know. If the stars are out, align, find north, look east, you know, look for certain lights I would normally see, you know. Um, if not that, uh, if it's if it's dark, dark, um, listen for uh, down the road from our place. Uh, there was this old another uh, cattle farmer, but he uh, he also raised uh, hound dogs. So almost every evening, uh, you can count on those hound dogs being hound dogs. You know what I mean? Um, so. I had multiple ways of helping me get my bearings to figure out which way home was. Um, so luckily, you know, I had that good internal compass and good woodsman knowledge enough to where uh, here I am waking up in the middle of nowhere, but I, I, I'm smart enough to be able to get home, you know. And I get home and, you know, I'm freaked out and, you know, and I, I wake up mom and dad that, you know, I, I just woke up out in the middle of nowhere. And that first time it was like, okay, go to bed, you know, and I went to bed and, you know, I came down the next morning and I'm like, you know, I, I was thoroughly freaked out. Like I woke up out in the middle of nowhere and they're like, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you're probably just sleepwalking is what they told me as I was sleepwalking. And then it happened again, you know, and the suckiest part was it happened rain or it, it, doesn't, it did not matter what the weather was outside. And that second time it was raining. And that's, that time really, really sucked. Um, uh, and I was actually farther away, but I, I still managed to get home. <clears throat> and this time when I woke them up they could tell I was from I was coming in from outside because I was soaking wet you know so this time they woke up and they're like where have you been and I was like this is it happened again you know I'm waking up out in the middle of a field and it's like well you're sleepwalking you know that's what they're telling me is I'm sleepwalking everybody's telling me I'm sleepwalking so I'm, I'm trying to figure out ways to stop myself from sleepwalking you know um, we started locking the door at night which you know, we never even locked a door in our house at night. We live so far out there, you know. But now we started locking the door. Um, it still happened. So I started, we had a door at the bottom of the steps to go upstairs. So started locking that door. 
and I still kept waking up out in the middle of nowhere, dude. <clears throat> so I even got to the point where I would wear my shoes and my pants and my shirt. So I figured, you know, if I wake up, I'm going to be ready, you know. And I would wake up and still be in only my boxers and my whatever shoes, shirt, and pants I was wearing would be gone. Just gone. And uh, mom and dad did not like that because they thought you know I was doing something to my shoes so I can get new shoes you know it was it was really weird man um, uh, I don't blame them for not understanding anything and uh, there's nobody to blame here at all it was just it was weird circumstances um, so uh, One time, when I woke up out in the middle of nowhere, and this was a good dozen times in, you know, a good dozen times in, I did notice that there was almost a, uh, a certain region of the area I like to wake up in. So uh, I kind of got familiar with the route home. It was almost, uh, when I would wake up, it would be within a... A half a mile circumference of a specific area <clears throat> so I would wake up anyway this one time um, on one of these uh, this one time I woke up out in the middle of nowhere you know I come to boxers barefoot no shirt no pants um, I went up on the ridge, I got my bearings, I realized I was about uh, two ridges past uh, this linear field that I've talked about in prior uh, episodes, it's even got kind of its own episode, I would recommend going and listening to that episode, but I realized I was on the other side of the linear field, and if you know anything about that linear field, I was on the wrong side of it. <clears throat> um, I was only the second ridge back, and I was in the only field on the second ridge, luckily. And, uh, you know, I was able to identify that. But I, I... I do not like crossing the linear field at night. Um, especially without a dog. Uh, or light. Um, so... I very cautiously had to make my way through uh, a series of woods and um, I'm coming out on that linear field and I just heard you know I was on the uh, the easternmost side of it about as close to the head of the creek before you go through the gate as you can get um, and off to the west, <clears throat> I heard the most ferocious uh, animal fury. Uh, it sounded like it sounded like a bear and a great dane had had a had a puppy. And that puppy had grown up. And that puppy was chewing on elephant bones. Is what it sounded like. Uh, uh, it had like a growl to it and it was definitely, you could tell it was, it was breaking bones it was chewing on something you know and I didn't even want to be part of it so I like <clears throat> it probably took me that that linear field is only about 25 maybe 30 yards across but I bet it took me almost an hour to cross it 
because I was going, I had gotten down on my belly and I was slithering through that field on my elbows and knees and I, there was like almost like um, a rhythmic pattern to whatever, whatever it was, was doing, you know, but um, for that hour, you know, I, I moved maybe one or two inches uh, every minute, if that until I crossed that field and I got up on the other side of that field and I mean I, I stayed cautious because I could still hear it uh, and I moved when it crunched you know what I mean um, and, and that probably from beginning to end like the time I began hearing that until I was far enough to far enough away that I took off running that probably almost took two hours plus because before I got home the sun already started coming up in the east uh, it hadn't broken the horizon but it had it had changed the uh, the color of the eastern sky you know you could tell it was it was morning um, <clears throat> it was one of the latest uh, coming home after waking up in a field um, events that I had had and uh, I got home and like I, I wasn't I got home and I wasn't even tired you know um, mom was already up she was almost ready for work this was summer you know so we didn't have school um, and so there was coffee you know so I drank the coffee I got some well I went inside I went upstairs I got some clothes on I came down I got some coffee because mom was about to leave for work and before I came back down she was already out <clears throat> out the door you know so I was drinking coffee I got myself a cup of coffee and I went to tell dad what I what I heard you know and you know I'm, usually if I woke up I'd tell somebody, you know, I had another sleepwalking thing, man. But this time it was different. Um, I told him I was hearing this this crunching sound, and it, it sounded like, um, you know, a huge dog and a bear had a baby, and that's what I was hearing, you know. So, uh, and it sounded like he was crunching bones. Um, and I told him it was in the linear field. And, uh... <laughs> he told me, you know, go find out what it was. And I was he said to take my... Uh, I had a... A couple years prior, my, my uncle had given me a ninja sword. <clears throat> so he wanted me to go back. He said, <clears throat> he said, go find out what it is. Make sure you take Abel and your sword. I was like, all right. So I got Abel, you know, and we went back. It wasn't that far. It was, you know, uh, about a half hour past the graveyard. So maybe an hour, an hour's walk. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> anyway, I head back there. And uh, we're coming over that ridge to go down into the linear field. And Abel starts like, uh, Abel starts like whining. It wasn't really a whine, whine, whimper. It was more like he had a, like a, a little bit of a whine every other breath at the end of his breath, you know. <clears throat> and we come down to the edge of that field, fixing to come out in woods to walk out in the field, and he stopped. He would not walk out in that field. And, I mean, that caught my attention at first. I'm like, what's wrong with you, you know? What are you doing? Because he, now he's whining, and he barked at me, and he sits. I'm like, what are you doing, you know? And then he just barks at me again. I'm like, okay. And I turn and I look out in the field. And off to the right, because we were coming in on the the, uh, the east side of that field again, you know. And off to the right, about halfway down that field, <laughs> there was eight cattle. Completely inviscerated and I use that that term lightly um, they were hmm, 
All right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Abel refused to go out in that field. But me being me, seeing all them cows, I, I had to go look, you know. Um, Abel's barking at me the whole time. The moment I step foot in that field, he starts barking, you know. And it's like 8.30, 9 o'clock. The sun's kind of up, but there's that, like, the morning mistiness is still, you know. And there's like a layer of foggy clouds, <clears throat> maybe 200 feet up, that are, that are moving by every so often it'd give you that shady cloudy misty morning look you know <clears throat> so i'm walking out in this field that my dog refuses to walk out into and uh because i want to go look at these cows um and i know i know specifically there were eight of them uh not seven not nine there were eight um and I walked up to the one that was closest to us. Uh, it was still about uh, almost a good hundred yards from where Abel refused to walk. And I'm looking at this cow. <clears throat> now, they were all identical. So, the, the skull, the bottom jaw had been completely ripped off. It was missing its tongue. The eyeballs were gone. There was a hole in the top of its skull, like right in between their eye, right in between the eyes. There was a single hole. I remember that is a very specific detail. I'll bring back up later, but I'm going to keep going because um, I'm starting at their head and I'm going to move on. <clears throat> so you got to the neck, and there was just the spine there. All the meat around the neck bone was gone there was no throat uh that was all gone from like the back of the jaw to like the collarbone uh rib cage area uh, that whole strip of meat was gone and it was removed from the bones like it was picked off the bone you know and so the chest the, everything inside of the chest gone nothing there also I gotta say none of this stuff was anywhere to be found it was gone and on top of that there wasn't no there was no blow flies there was nothing on these these animals um, I, I think it's partially because of the field uh, that they happen to be laying in um, that field already had a dead zone around it but uh there was nothing there no no nothing was on them gnats flies nothing and all their guts from the, the the upper part of the rib cage to the tail everything was just missing there was skin there there was hide there there was the the you know the fur and all that was still there um but it, everything else was gone anything that went inside that cow was gone um it was it was weird very weird and there were eight of them just like this and I mean they were they all had the exact same everything to them the hole in the head the missing eyes the missing jawbone the missing tongue the missing neck meat and the missing organs they were just basically skull spine hooves legs and ribs you know with a tail everything else was gone and uh there was not like a big if i went by this area at like 5 30 ish and now it's 8 30 ish so three hours maybe four hours let's just say it was four hours later um there was no blood anywhere around these bodies and every one of those cows should have had a huge um ring identifying the invisceration you know uh, and I'm going through these cows and I'm looking at them and I'm looking at them and I got Abel barking off in the background and it was just like this this twilight zone dude <clears throat> and I had gotten down to like the seventh cow and there was one more cow just a little bit uh, uh, west from there 
but before I got to it, that uh, large dog bear growl sound um, come out from the, the, the darkness of the woods just ahead of me. It was, it wasn't loud. It sounded like it was a warning. Um, you know, don't take one more step. And now this is, this is the weirdest part. So I hear it and it, it's no louder than maybe a cat's purr, but I heard it. And Abel was on, he's a good, you know, 150, almost 200 yards away from me now. Uh, the opposite side of the field and the moment I heard that uh, bear growl that was as soft as a cat's purr he stopped barking um, before it the the bear growl stopped Abel stopped barking like halfway through it so I was able to hear the end of the bear growl which seemingly got louder because now Abel isn't barking, if any of that makes sense. And um, normally, uh, as curious of a kid as I am, normally that would be incentive for me to move forward. But there was something, there was something different with this intimidation value. Uh, from this particular growl especially considering the twilight zone that I was standing in and the field I knew I was in and the woods that I knew that growl just came from uh, 2 plus 2 is 4 you know and uh, I pulled my sword out and I slowly backed up uh, you know back towards our side of the, the linear field you know, and um, I'm pretty good with a sword, man. Uh, I can cut the flame off a candle, you know. Um, I'm really good with a sword, especially back then. Um, so I had, I, I had confidence, you know, I can handle myself. Um, but this uh, thing. Um, it definitely that that growl not only uh, quieted my dog but it 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 had a fear to it it had like almost a paralyzing fear to it and um, I was able to you know back up pull my sword out and and back up towards the other woods but um, I could feel what what that growl had done you know I just I was able to push through it um, so <clears throat> you know I backed up I got back into the woods Abel darted down since I'm in the woods he's licking my hands he's whining he's licking my hands he keeps looking back across the field and whining and licking my hands you know I was like, we need to get home boy and you know it's like he knew exactly what I said and he barked you know he let me know that that was a good idea. So that first, I don't know, that first 20, 30 minutes, of course, I kept my sword out and it was just like one step, listen, one step, listen, one step, listen. Um, but uh, so we got back to the house and I tell dad, you know, what I've seen and I, all these cows and all you know what happened and everything and he's telling me that uh it sounds like a the there's this there's this tool that farmers use to to put down cows that it's like this this uh, spring-loaded gun that it shoots like this bar into their head and based on what i was seeing uh that's what he said it sounded like it happened but it didn't make no sense that the farmer would do that and then take all the all the all the guts out so of course we 
we got hold of uh, the owner, you know, and we let him know about these cows, and he come out and he looked at them, and he they did not do that to them cows, um, and it, there was a big ordeal about them cows being slaughtered. Um, I don't remember much about it, you know, because that was between like the owner had multiple different people come out there. I do remember that. Um, and and the day came out when they hauled hauled the carcasses out too. Um, but there was no reasonable explanation for why any of that happened. Um, 